Hi, good afternoon. I want to thank everybody who is here for coming, for, for being here. I want to thank Vladimir who's pointing to himself right now because, because Vladimir is the reason that I'm here. Um, you know, but um, to, to, to just to get a little bit serious, um, Jeremy kind of finished where I wanted to start. There are a number of people that you have to thank, and I try to cover them in the acknowledgements page on this, but there are two people here, specifically yeah, Indra, big up to you too. All right. There are two people here that I really want to single out. One, my mother. Because William Shakespeare has nothing on Pearl Barrett, nothing at all. And so if you think that the language in the book is, um, is lively, engaging language, it is from having 30-something years of, ex of life having to interact with my mother. Um, and the, the craft in the prose, I, I can't lay claim to, 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 to the craft in the prose. The craft in the prose has to go to, to Funchu. Um, he is the voice that is constantly in my head when I'm writing and editing stories. And even when I'm finished and I think that the story is amazing and brilliant, he will say, no, that cannot work. You have to change that. Right? That sentence, blah, 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 and you know, like the last chapter in this that I felt was a good chapter, he sends me, you know, three days after reading the chapter, this long email about all the things that are wrong about the chapter. And I just had to lay down for a week after that because there was no way I could contend with it, you know? But let me get into the story because that's what you all want to hear. Um, I decided to read, I kind of couldn't make up my mind, and I decided I was going to go with the title story. Um, so I'm going to get very, very much into the title story now. The 10 Days Executive. Basil needed a walk back. It was almost eight months since he got laid off from the, sub the security job he had at the bus terminus. Patience, Basil, patience. The manager, Mr. Eiffel, had tried to reassure him. In a month time, we go call you back. You know it had election. You know government change and they had was to shake up stuff. Give we a few weeks. Once the dust settle, we go hire back all we own workers. Being a patient fellow, Basil wait two months. He ain't bound to go back to work right away. In fact, the little layoff did already come like a holiday for him. At first, he stay home and help Dulcie around the house and harass you a little bit, like any self-respecting husband. But then he started to feel tired hanging around the house and he went to see Mr. Eiffel. Only to find out Mr. Eiffel and all get fired and some new man named Bihari take his place and be Harry and have no time to see anybody and ain't know nothing about no job that some previous manager promised. It's a new dispensation now, be Harry see. Checking the papers for when we have vacancies. It's then Basil start to worry. He didn't figure that the change in government would affect him so. He realized that since he here and be Harry here wasn't the same texture, it probably mean that the two of them did vote for different parties. And as it was a government job he was waiting on, he might have to wait a while. Maybe until the next elections, if the party could get the act in order and get back in power. Six more weeks pass and a little bit of money save up in the bank almost done and Dulcie starting to get vexed because now Basil ain't have no money and he still wants sex every day. <laughs> Basil decided to try a little hustle. He borrowed a partner can't pull bull with it in the night in areas where the regular taxi wasn't working. It went okay for a while, but it didn't last. The man wanted him to bring in $60 a night and sometimes Basil was barely making that. So no sleep in the night and in the day he catch an ass because Dulcie face swell up like a crap after rain and she calling him good for nothing under she breath whole time. He getting real fed up and frustrated and sometimes when the frustration, frustration hit him so he feeling to cuff up she ass good and proper, proper. But he afraid she have a cousin who is a special branch police. <laughs> a sweater police. Basil ain't afraid of ordinary police enough, you know, but he don't make joke with sweater police. <laughs> Anybody who could wear that kind of wool in this hair, he'd have to be honest. <laughs> he remembered once when he was working as a security in a grocery, he see two of them beat down a bandit. They start with him at the front of the grocery and end up in a storeroom in the back. The two of them take turns beating the man, and after they finish subduing the suspect, was straight hospital fair. <laughs> so Basil decided to leave Dulcie and she muttering alone because he ain't want to get subdued. <laughs> but still, he's studying day and night how to make money. He try wrapping grocery, but he pay real low. Four dollars an hour, and he working from nine in the morning to all quality hour in the night. After one month, he leave that too. By then, Dulcie stopped muttering. She's talking in plain English now. 
Basil, you're real worthless for truth, you know. M my mother did warn me. She tell me you're blight, but no, I hot. I want man, but like as a man, who I get. And look now the pressure I see it. Basil remained quiet. He ain't say peep. He know the day he up. Me mouth, she go answer him back. And he can't take it when woman answer him back. He know for sure, for sure, he go lash she. So to keep the peace, he hush him out. By the time August mountain reach, Basil was at the end of his rope. One night, Dulcie outright blank him. She turn, she turn she back and shoots. Why they ask you don't go and get a 10 days, she asks, before you try to give me a nine months. I'll stop here. <laughs> writing the, the, the stories, I would say the, the public politics. Um, I only became really actively politicized, I would say, within the last six or seven years. Um, this collection started long before that, and the personal politics, the domestic politics, the interrelationship politics, I find that was easier for me to write. Um, because a lot of it deals, a lot of it is taken from spaces that I'm familiar with um, based on um, the lives of people that I know. Whereas with things that are linked to like national politics, electoral politics, that takes a little bit more time for me because I have to think about it and I have to digest it and I have to write it in such a way that it hits on all of the nuances because our politics here not, is not simple. You know, there, there are a lot of things playing, a lot of things seething under the, the surface. And with this story, this story really and truly, oh, when I started writing, it was just to talk about a man who couldn't find a walk and change his religion, religion to find a walk. But it was linked to what was going on nationally at that point in time, you know? Uh, you uh, involved at teaching at both the tertiary level and the secondary level. And um, so you are intimately familiar with the education system. Um, how have those uh, so, uh, those places in your professional life provided you with a material for your fiction? There's a story in here called Before I Dead that looks at um, what goes on in the secondary school system. Uh, but it's not, I, I don't think of it as all encompassed, like it's only talking about the secondary school system. It is really looking at how, as a society, we are violent. Um, we, and that, and that, violence keeps playing off in cycles that you have the bullying taking place and the bullying that takes place in the story isn't student to student bullying alone it is also st staff bullying students and the student feeling the need to take back his power and he's taking back his power the only way he knows how through the use of a gun on the school compound and i tried to tell this story in the voice of um the young man who says um you know a, they gave me a vex so I come to school with a gun this morning. And that story was sparked off from a conversation that I had with an actual 16-year-old boy. He didn't have a gun, he had a knife. Um, the guards and they would look into John Beam and I had asked the guards, could I speak to him please? And we took a walk, we were sitting down and he said to me, well, you know, Mr. all is harassing me. They all is John Beam men. So I come, with a gun, I come with a knife for them this morning, right? If they jump in me today, you know, and I listened to this story and it, it, he, was, he, he was responding because he was just fed up of being harassed all the time. And that was one morning on a school compound. When you think about, when you think about people having to go through that 
decade after decade, generation after generation. You understand how things like Ferguson can happen, how Baltimore can happen, because you're constantly up applying pressure and you don't expect that the pressure has to release and that morning what the boy was really telling me was I get fed up and I, this is how I was going to release pressure today by bringing this knife to school and if anybody here asked me they was going to get it. I, I suspect too that um, that is the source of your language your interaction at that level of the society where people, uh, the young people are experimenting with language they creating new uh, new registers, new ways of speaking, and so on. Because one of the things that um, really uh, strikes me frontally in this collection is your facility with the language of the street. Your facility with the language that actually captures um, the essential nature of Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago's um, ways of speaking. I don't know if you want to comment on that aspect of your writing? Yeah, I'd, I'd say yes. Being teaching English language and literature at both the secondary and the tertiary level, um, especially having when you end up having to, to talk constantly about how the Creole impacts and affects the standard English here, right? Because we, we are told that we speak sta standard English, but really our mother tongue is Creole here. Um, so yes, Teaching at the secondary and tertiary level is important and has influenced that. But I also think that I'm fortunate to, to, have been, to, have, to have been in the education system here as a student by the time we had started bringing Caribbean authors onto the syllabus. I, went, I started reading Selvon and Naipaul and Loveless from primary into secondary school. And you can't underplay the impact of being exposed to your own literature from a young age on how you read the world and how you see the world. So if anybody, I mean, if you, when you get asked questions like, you know, who are your great influences? I, I see all of my great influences are regional first, not European or North American. They're all regional first. Oh, I got to Africa eventually. <laughs> 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 right? But all of my big influences started here regionally and for me